So uh, <laughs> it's, it's time to get started. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, today's speaker, Louis Gross, to you. Uh, Lou is the uh, Beeman, the Distinguished Professor of Ecology and Evolution of Biology and Mathematics, and also the Director of the Institute of Environmental Modeling at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. He's also the director of the National Institute for Mathematical and Biological Synthesis, which is a National Science Foundation funded center to foster research and education at the interface between math and biology. Uh, his BS uh, in uh, mathematics comes from Drexel University, and his PhD in applied mathematics from Cornell University. He's been at uh, UT uh, Knoxville since 1979. Uh, his research focuses on the applications of mathematics and computational methods in many areas of ecology, including disease ecology, landscape ecology, spatial control for natural resource management, photosynthetic dynamics, and the, de and the development of cognitive curricula for the life science undergraduate. He has uh, multiple honors. Uh, he is uh, the uh, direct president of the Society for Mathematical Biology, president of the UTK Faculty Senate, Treasurer for the American Institute of Biological Sciences and Chair of the National Research Council Committee on Education by Complexity Research. He's also a fellow of the American Association of Advancement in Science. Today he will talk about irrational basis for hope, a human behavioral modeling and climate change. And I'm very curious about this talk. It has these three concepts that are not necessarily associated with each, with each other, which is rational basis, uh, human behavioral modeling, and <laughs> Thank you very much, Elka. I really appreciate the invitation. There's an amazing collection of very uh, wonderful speakers that you've had here over the years, and that's, uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be part of this series. Um, so I, 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 I'm going to start off by saying that that was Baba Brinkman, who you heard doing the uh, climate rap that he did while he was a songwriter in residence with us at the University of Tennessee as part of the Institute um, that we, uh, we started, and that arose because of a Princeton faculty member uh, who uh, wrote a, um, a song called The Coon and Popper Knee Jerk Philosophy of Science Blues. Um, that's Henry Horn, uh, and, uh, and Henry uh, performed that, and if you want to hear Henry performing it, you can go to the website uh, because he allowed us to, to post it. So that was the motivation in part for uh, for Baba and the whole songwriter series. Um, so this, uh, this project that I'm going to focus on is really a joint effort from a whole group of folks. Um, the uh, National Institute for Mathematical and Biological Synthesis and the Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center, which is another NSF-sponsored synthesis center, um, uh, sponsor what we call working groups. So these are collaborations between uh, people generally across uh, numerous disciplines uh, to focus on a particular problem, meet several times, and, uh, and, and come to some, some conclusions for this. Um, the problem that this group, which includes um, sociologists, psychologists, geographers, um, mathematical folks like me, um, and uh, climate scientists, uh, uh, the objective of this group was to analyze whether or not there were ways to incorporate uh, human behavior directly into climate models. And I'm, the, uh, the idea was we were not sure before we started this whether or not there was any basis in which uh, incorporating direct human behavior and feedback along with climate models would lead to any significant change in the projected futures and, and trajectories of the planet. So that was the, uh, the idea. And of course, the underlying motivation for this are predictions such as this one. So this is a, a graph from one of the many uh, large global climate models, the one of the Hadley ones. Uh, and what this graph shows is a comparison of the base. The base here is the average temperature at a location uh, from 1960 to 1990 versus the projection for approximately 2100 from this particular climate model. And if you'll note, pretty much everything uh, is on the uh, red side or the middle of this, which means that the projection is an increase in temperature at these locations uh, that varies across the planet but uh, is significantly positive. So that's what um, is sort of a way of illustrating 
the potential future relative to global temperature uh, changes. Um, so I'm going to start off by doing a very quick summary of climate models uh, and then go on and say something about models of human behavior, uh, the, a particular one called the theory of planned behavior um, and how we link that uh, theory to a climate model. There are seats up here if you want to come up here. Um, and then say something about projections and I'll wind up with some future directions. Okay? So, um, first of all, uh, of course, human activities are very much linked with the Earth systems. And our objective here was to consider how human risk perception and behaviors uh, arising from this might impact and interact with climate change. And I, I will say right at the beginning, if you have questions about risk perception, the world's leading authority is sitting right up here. Uh, and so I'm going to defer those questions to Elke. But, uh, uh, but the, the idea was to, was to incorporate human perception of risk with climate change. And the, the real interest is whether there's potential feedbacks from human systems which are sufficient to in some significant way affect the metric for uh, climate, global climate temperature change and that, as illustrated in that, that first sl uh, slide. Okay. Um, so are there uh, shifts in behaviors that may arise due to perception about the risk uh, associated with future climate? Um, so I'm, I'm going to start out by just uh, pointing out that there are a number of different types of models. So these are mathematical um, ways to incorporate how we think about how the world works in terms of climate systems. Um, and I'm not going to talk about all these. I'm just going to point out that there are some simplified ones. Uh, there are energy balance models that, that basically take a latitudinal band approach, one dimensional across the planet, to, to other ones that are two dimensional versions of that that include uh, depth in the atmosphere. And then the, the ones that we'll mo mostly sort of talk about are the, the general circulation models and the integrated assessment models. So the general circulation models are the ones that are uh, generally now used to compare alternative futures uh, that incorporate um, the atmosphere, ocean, and uh, the interactions be between them. They often have uh, 10 to 20 or 30 layers uh, that are in the atmosphere. That's sort of illustrated um, over here in this little, this little graph um, right there. And, uh, and then they can have uh, layers in the ocean as well. Uh, the scale at which these operate are fairly coarse, um, on the order of 200 to 500 kilometers or so. And, uh, and for a given time step, these models basically look at the physical actions and processes that are going on in each cell, how they connect across to neighboring cells, and then simulate that across the entire planet. So, uh, you can think of this as taking the entire planet and spreading it out into these grid points and looking at connections between the physical uh, atmospheric processes that go on that, that, that drive them. Um, and the kinds of processes that they incorporate are land-atmosphere interactions, ocean-atmosphere interactions, and, um, and, and, uh, and of course uh, the variety of greenhouse gases and other gases, as well as changes in solar input. Um, notice that uh, it has this, this graph has this little thing called human influences in there. These models really do not incorporate humans in any direct way at all. Okay? Um, now, th there's a way of comparing these different models. Uh, there, there's a formal process called CMIP, which is a way of uh, looking at different models and how they compare in projecting the future. And I, I will say that these climate models uh, have advanced tremendously over the past 40, 50 years. Um, and 40 or 50 years ago, there were a, a, a set of groups around the planet um, in very different countries starting out uh, to develop these. And um, initially, there were quite different projections from them. Uh, there still are differences in projection, but there's become a certain uh, amount of concordance with how they project the future of uh, global temperature. Uh, and their objectives um, are, are uh, then instantiated in the sense that they're compared through a formal process like this. And uh, so this is a, a paper um, that's part of the 
fifth assessment report. Um, and uh, and uh, let's just take a look at this upper figure. That's, that's the one to focus on. First of all, on the horizontal axis are uh, time periods out, in this case, only to 2050. And uh, this is historical, so this is data. And the variants around there are uh, different ways that different models have uh, been linked to historical data. Uh, and then you see each one of these different colored lines correspond to many different models using what are called representative concentration pathways. So what these do is take some assumption about human greenhouse gas emissions and project what that assumption means for, in this case, global temperature. Okay? And this is a mean global temperature. The, the important thing to take away from this is it's increasing, generally, and uh, across all these different, um, basically, scenarios for greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, that, it, that there's a, there is a good deal of variability even within a particular <coughs> kind of model group. Okay? But in general, these are projecting, on average, by 2050, uh, a one, to, uh, one degree or so uh, Celsius increase in global temperature relative to <coughs> current time. So current time is essentially 1990. Okay? Um, so these, these climate models, including the, the most complicated uh, ones, like the ones that have basically millions of different uh, variables in them, uh, they don't take into account feedbacks from human social systems at all. Um, so they basically assume some fixed set of future mitigation, if there is any mitigation, of future um, greenhouse gas emissions. There are a set of models that are called integrated assessment models that are designed to incorporate particularly economic aspects of climate change within them, um, and as well as sort of human demography, agricultural production, and so on. They also assume some future fixed scenario of uh, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So this is, a, this is a sort of caricature of a complicated integrated assessment model uh, produced by folks at uh, MIT, including one of our collaborators, Adam Schlosser. Um, and uh, note that here at the bottom, it has basically the uh, global circulation model. And then there's linked to it um, water, uh, energy, and infrastructure, and de demographics. There's not really feedback in these integrated assessment models uh, to the climate system from uh, changing greenhouse gas emissions. They also are all driven by a particular scenario. So that's a quick summary of uh, the variety of models that have been developed for uh, analyzing climate change. Um, now I want to go on and say something about models for human behavior. And I'm not, there's, there's lots of these. I'm not going to talk about the wide variety of them. I'm going to focus on a few things, okay? So I'm not going to summarize all of them. One of the, one of the earliest um, approaches uh, is due to these two folks. So that's John von Neumann and Oscar Morgenstern, and they produced a, uh, a book called The Theory of Games and Economic Behavior. And actually, uh, in this room on the chalkboard behind here, there's a game that a couple of students were working on right before I came in. Um, so the theory of games was a, a way to look at um, cooperative and non-cooperative behavior between groups uh, or um, individuals or entities of some sort. And one of the key things that this theory attempted to do was to take account of how one individual or group responded relative to changes in the frequency of behaviors uh, um, you know, by another group, okay, if it's uh, two groups. And then there's a whole body of theory about what happens when you have multiple groups and, and, and so on. So in cooperative uh, game theory. Now, this, when this book came out, came out in the mid-40s, um, it uh, started to have a big impact. There were lots of uh, people who said, oh, this is a, a great way of uh, thinking about the world. It's going to have major impact. And it did have major impact. There are many, many people who have used game theory to analyze all sorts of situations. Um, and in, in biology, it led to a whole growth of uh, what are called evolutionary uh, stable strategies, a way of thinking about uh, e evolution from a game theoretic perspective. Um, and there was a lot of hype. And, and I just want to point out that um, that hype has not quite been lived up to. It's, there's no one theory that's going to, uh, or approach or method that's going to lead to a 
major new understanding about how the world works and it's going to solve all our problems. Um, so after this, there was um, catastrophe theory, um, then there was chaos theory, then there was complexity theory. All of these were sort of major uh, ideas that grew out mainly of, out of mathematics that would change the way we think about the world. And, uh, and nowadays, it's artificial intelligence. Okay. So all of these are tools to help us understand certain components of how the world works, uh, but no one of them is going to solve all of our, all of our issues. So this uh, theory of games is, uh, uh, is very, very prevalent. It's one way of thinking about uh, human interactions individually and group interactions. Um, another approach came from someone who is one of my childhood heroes, uh, Isaac Asimov. Isaac Asimov was an amazingly talented individual. Um, and one of the things that he did was write uh, one of the classic series of uh, books in science fiction called the Foundation Trilogy initially, and then there were a whole host of other ones. And the Foundation Trilogy um, is uh, usually characterized as one of the most important scientific uh, science fiction books around. Uh, and and I, I thought I would quote something from the first volume of this. Um, this is from the Encyclopedia Galactica, as, as he made it up. Uh, and, and it says, it defines psychohistory as that branch of mathematics which deals with the reactions of human conglomerates to fixed social and economic stimuli. It goes on to say implicit in these definitions is the assumption that human conglomerates uh, being dealt with is sufficiently large for valid statistical treatment. And then it goes on and talks about a theorem, a set of theorems associated with this notion. So, um, of course, there, th he made this up, okay? Uh, this is totally made up. Um, and, uh, and, and the key figure uh, was Harry Seldon, who uh, was a mathematician. Now, for a, a young person you know, growing up thinking about mathematics, it's, there aren't that many fictional characters who are heroes, who are mathematicians. And so this, is, this was one of my heroes. Um, and, um, and, and this notion of being able to look across large numbers of individuals and doing predictions about what happens from it um, led to a body of theory. So uh, Don DeAngelis and I edited this book uh, in uh, now 26 years ago. Um, uh, we called it individual-based models, and this was applied in ecological systems to thinking about individual organisms moving around on a landscape, interacting, and uh, having a set of behaviors that allow you then to aggregate up from the individual to what's going on at, at broader spatial and temporal scales. And at least one person in the audience has a paper in that book. <laughs> Simon sitting up here. Uh, and um, he doesn't remember it, maybe, but there is one with his name on it in there. <laughs> and um, and, and that, that, this, this notion of building up from the characteris characteristics of individual organisms uh, has been applied in many, many social systems as well. There's a whole journal called the Journal of Artificial Societies and Social Simulation, which takes this approach. It's called agent-based modeling approaches. And this is another way of instantiating human behavior and putting it into a, uh, a, a system that allows you to, to project the future. Um, uh, and then another way to think of this comes out of the, uh, social psychology. Um, and this is the theory of planned behavior. In general, this, this theory um, is, is a way of saying how one's beliefs uh, affects behavior and how that interacts with um, other nor the normative behavior of other individuals or groups and the perception of what control an individual has over their behaviors. Um, this is due to Oxen, who uh, published this back in the early 90s. There's been a lot of uh, uh, other work in this area. And I'm going to focus on this, but I want to point out at this point that there are a number of ways of linking the different kinds of human behavior models to the different kind of climate models. You could, you could really do something small by having a very simple model for human behavior. It doesn't have lots of agents or anything like that, um, with just a few variables and a very simple climate model. And that would be one sort of end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum would be these general circulation models which have millions of variables and millions and millions of humans running around on the planet, okay? Um, and in order to, 
that, that's at the other end of the spectrum. In order to do that, you'd have to have a, a pretty good characterization of what individual humans might be doing to interact, as well as, of course, linking that to the, to the uh, general circulation model. Now, what, what we've done and what I'm going to talk about is not either end of that spectrum. <coughs> there are people working at the sort of um, low end of the spectrum, low in the sense of small numbers of um, variables associated with human behavior and small numbers of variables associated with the climate model. Um, and we, we chose a more intermediate uh, kind of approach. So I need to say something about what the theory of planned behavior does. Um, and so it considers this interaction between uh, what are called perceived social norms. Uh, so that's your perception of what other individuals around you are doing. So the notion is that if everyone around you is smoking cigarettes and the media is saying cigarettes are great for you, and then you're going to be much more likely to smoke cigarettes. Okay? And we actually have you know, historical <laughs> evidence for that in the US. Um, and um, you can think of the same thing with regard to other uh, aspects of behavior. Uh, and then this notion of perceived behavioral control, uh, which is uh, how much you perceive your uh, control is associated with a set of behaviors. So underlying this are attitudes. Attitudes are your positive or, or negative evaluation of uh, what behaviors and policies uh, you might carry out relative, and I'm, I'm going to talk about climate change here, but it could be with other things. Um, and this has to do with the perception uh, of risk associated with uh, the adverse effects of climate change if you take no action as well as a perception of efficacy. In other words, the extent that you believe that your behavior will actually influence, um, in this case, greenhouse gas emissions. All right. So this theory of planned behavior um, has this combination between the perceived social norm, what other individuals are doing, and how much that influences changes in behavior by, uh, by individuals across the groups. And then perceived behavioral control that refers to your perception of how much control you have over whether or not you perform a behavior, uh, and, um, and that is both your perception of your ability to perform a specific action, in this case mitigation, or to influence policymakers who might, um, might interact with that. So the, the sort of graphical view of the theory of planned behavior is this is the typical kind of approach that people take as a conceptual model for the interaction between norms and be behavioral control and, and actual behaviors. And what, what we proceeded to do was to basically take this and to put it into a mathematical form. And here's the sort of overall structure. Um, I want to point out that this has a low, uh, basically, a, you think of it as a climate model, but it's a, in this case just a carbon cycle model as a part of a climate model. Um, and it has a feedback cycle with it. So that means that the time period here of interaction in this model uh, is, in our case, a year, but it didn't have to be a year, in which um, there is a uh, cycle of across the social model that then links to the climate model. Um, and I'm going to go through this in a little bit of detail to point out some of the characteristics of it. Okay? So the first thing here is, what is it that drives risk perception? There's a number of things that could drive it. Our choice was what we call frequency of extreme events. Think of these as major droughts, hurricanes, a change in what you perceive the world is doing that directly impacts you due to climate change and, uh, in this case, extreme events. So long periods of drought, high temperature, et cetera. And the way that we model that, I'm happy to talk about if someone's interested, we base it on data and a Poisson distribution of how much extreme events there are uh, as a function of global temperature. And that's uh, parameterized by, by data sets. Okay? Um, and then there's sensing. Okay? So uh, not only does there have to be an extreme event, but there has to be a, the capability for individuals to assess that it was an extreme event. Okay? So that's part of your memory, okay, of what's going on. And, and yet, and of course, people forget things, okay? So uh, again, a standard approach in, in, this, uh, up in this methodology is to have a pool of resources and a rate at which those pools are forgotten because you don't remember that there was this hurricane 20 years ago because you didn't live through it or because you didn't have family stories that told you about it. 
Um, at, at at 20 years is a long time. And so that leads to uh, a, a model that allows us to basically keep track of what we call events in memory. Okay? So this corresponds to uh, whether or not these set of extreme events really are something that you remember or you don't remember. And I'm th speaking here of a single individual, but this is a model for a group. Okay? So it's really a model for how a group uh, perceives this. Uh, from that is perceived risk. And perceived risk, um, it's, it's not clear uh, exactly how risk uh, arises from uh, uh, extreme events. So we actually have alternative forms for this. So on the lower axis would be a number of extreme events. Okay? A negative could arise because it's less than your memory of them. Okay? Um, and then perceived risk is on this axis. In, our, in this case, it's scaled 0 to 1. And there's a variety of possible functional forms for how people perceive risk. We don't have really good data on which ones there are. So um, uh, one of our collaborators on this is Peter Howe, who's done a lot of surveys of attitudes to climate change. And we couldn't really specify which of these would be a, uh, the most appropriate. But, um, but the idea here is that this one has a much steeper slope in, re in response. The cubic one is much flatter. And the linear one just changes linearly. Okay. Um, so that ties into in, into this um, process. Um, and then that leaves to um, uh, a variety of other components here, uh, perceived um, <coughs> efficacy, which is your uh, perceived extent to which uh, behavior actually influences greenhouse gas emissions. Um, they, together with perceived risk, leads to a, a, a variable uh, that we call attitudes. Um, and that then is affected by your perception of how other people behave. Uh, perceived behavioral norms, uh, perceived social norms, and then uh, your perceived control of how that happens. From that, that leads to emissions behavior. And there's a constraint, though, on how much uh, change there can be. Um, and there's, of course, arguments about how much uh, society could potentially modify greenhouse gas emissions within some time period. Uh, so we assume that there's some constraint on that. And, and put that in the, in the model and then vary it. Um, that leads to greenhouse gas emissions in this model. Um, and those greenhouse gas emissions then come in and interact with a climate model to, uh, to impact the next time step, in this case next year, for average global temperature. So I want to point out, there's lots of assumptions in this that, that I'm going to point out. Um, the uh, model that this is coupled to is an integrated assessment model uh, produced by uh, a nonprofit called Climate Interactive. Uh, it is called Sea Roads. It's used by uh, lots of people to sort of project the impacts of climate on a wide variety of uh, um, uh, social uh, and economic aspects. Um, and, um, and, and it has a, a sort of simplified climate model that is not as complex at all as the general circulation models. But it is parametrized to have consistency with the main results of the uh, representative uh, pathways in several of the, of the climate models. Um, it also has a regional breakdown, but we're just using it globally as a, as a single, single model. So what are some of the key assumptions in this connection between the social model and, um, and the climate model? Well, first of all, that human behavior is indeed feedback to climate through a modification uh, in carbon emissions. And I want to point out that we did not, we purposely did not try to bias this. There can be increases in greenhouse gas emissions due to behavior, and there can be decreases. Okay? Um, and they arise due to uh, the behavioral part of the model. Um, so the behavioral responses that are included are due to risk perception, okay? due to individuals perceiving that um, there's a progression of extreme events and responding to that progression of extreme events. Um, there's an annual number of extreme events that are characterized by temperature conditions uh, with a statistical model inside this. Um, and um, modification of emissions uh, due to behavior um, leads to a, a basically a pool uh, if we're dealing, there's two ways we think about this, cumulative changes and non-cumulative. If there are cumulative changes, you can think of this as building up infrastructure. 
that infrastructure could be you buying a uh, Tesla, okay, which has much lower emissions, although there might be arguments about the electro electricity generation part of this, but uh, presumably has much lower em emissions than if you were to buy a Chevy Suburban. Not that I have anything against Chevys or Suburbans. But, um, so uh, uh, so th there's the cumulative infrastructure buildup, okay, and uh, that re reflects the capability for there to be uh, responses that, that are not year to year, okay. Um, and there's also the other assumption is that there's a minimum level of, of carbon emissions that, that no behavior modifications can, can change. Now, I'm not going to talk about the details of the code at all. I'm just going to point out that this is in uh, a, a standard tool. It's called Vensim, which is a system simulation tool that basically does this as a dynamical system model. Okay, it's a set of difference equations that simulate a differential equation. So there's extreme event simulation that's linked to uh, basically attitude and perceived social norm calculation, and then that's linked to uh, the climate model to produce greenhouse gas emissions the, the next time period. Okay? Um, so what are the results of this? So I'll spend a little time on this. So we ran the model starting at 2000 the, and, and then going up to 2100. Um, and this is a result of many runs, I'm pointing out. Um, on the vertical axis is degree centigrade difference from what's called pre-industrial. So one of the standard ways of characterizing changes in global temperature is making a comparison to the mid-1800s, and that's what we're doing here. Okay? So where we are right now is slightly over 1. It's about 1.1, 1 1.2 uh, degrees Celsius um, change from pre-industrial. Okay? Um, and the set of uh, results here correspond to different projections of the future. The one in black here with the little red lines around it corresponds to the baseline model from uh, sea roads that kind of characterizes um, one of the standard uh, representative uh, pathways for greenhouse gas emissions that are used in the global climate model. So if you look at the sort of average in the IPCC reports, uh, it comes up to about five degrees Celsius increase by 2100, and that's, the, that's this black line, okay? Uh, let's not worry about the, uh, the, the, the red lines are just plus or minus 5% release around that, just to point that out. Um, but then the model itself has, suppose that we actually um, have no um, emissions, uh, zero gigatons of emissions uh, additional from what's there now, okay? Uh, then that leads to this lower line right there. So even if we could completely eliminate additional greenhouse gas emissions, okay, it would, that's, that's what our future is. Um, the, the model then has, suppose that we actually uh, take this and we have a, a more realistic 20 gigaton minimum emission and run the model, um, it comes up to about oh, two and a half or so degrees by 2100. And then uh, our combined social model with the climate model, the minimum of it is this line here, up to about three degrees, a little bit over, and the maximum of it is way up here. So again, I want to point out, we didn't want to bias this model so that it only had reductions in greenhouse em uh, gas emissions, it, it could have more. Okay. Um, and, uh, and a similar sort of thing, this is uh, basically gigatons of carbon uh, em uh, emissions over the course of, uh, of the time period, and uh, let's not worry about, about that. Okay? Now, one of the other ways of illustrating uh, the impacts of different model assumptions is whether or not if you had cumulative impact, meaning uh, buildup of infrastructure, whether that has different impacts than non-cumulative ones. Non-cumulative ones you can th just think of as having lots of people drive less um, and therefore burn less uh, fossil fuels. Okay? Um, rather than accumulating it by people buying um, uh, uh, sort of either a, a very efficient vehicle or investing in uh, wind turbines that uh, each year it's not just a, uh, a, a single uh, reduction. There's a cumulative reduction that arises due to infrastructure. 
Uh, and, and the key point here on the vertical axis is temperature change from pre-industrial. So the average uh, is uh, slightly less, it's about 4.9 when you look across uh, this collection of models. And, um, and the point here is that the non-cumulative impacts don't really, the, the, you don't really have any results that, from that that could significantly impact the change in future uh, global temperature. Whereas, if you look at the cumulative impacts, they can significantly lead to a reduction or an increase. So the way to think about this is that for a particular um, uh, set of model assumptions, the width of this corresponds to the probability of that arising at that temperature from a large number of runs. Um, and then there's three different forms here. Logistic is the one that produces a potential for uh, significant uh, reductions in global temperature from the 4.9 to, to, uh, to somewhere around 3 or so. Okay? Um, and then um, we can look at the same sort of thing by comparing these three different assumptions about human behavior in response to risk. Um, and, uh, and again, uh, the, the one that, that actually is significant is the logistic form, so that's the one that comes up, has a, has a, um, a rapid increase and then a tail off, uh, whereas cubic, which goes up and across and up, does, does not, and neither does linear in terms of their impact. So the peak here is right around the, the 4.9 for the linear and, and the cubic. It's not going to change that much. Um, and then there's a way to compare and contrast, and I, I won't go into this, but just to say that we have ways of comparing and contrasting the different uh, assumptions in the model about perce uh, perceived behavioral control and, uh, and perceived social norm. Um, and then there's a formalized way of teasing apart the variety of assumptions in the model and saying what really leads to a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and what really leads to an increase. Uh, so this is what's called a regression tree partitioning. You look across hundreds of thousands of, of runs with different underlying parameter values, and you can see which ones lead to, in this case, a reduction to about 3.8 degrees um, Celsius versus 4.9, which is the, the mean from the IPCC, and 5.7, the high end. So there's a way of teasing apart which have the most impact, okay, and the interactions between them. Okay, so I'm going to just talk about some conclusions from this and then say something about future. Um, so, first of all, the results from this are that integrating a human behavior uh, model with a climate change model uh, can reduce the uh, global temperature by 2100 significantly. So the range that we get by this uh, introduction of human behavior in there is from 3.4 to 6.2 degrees Celsius by 2100. Uh, and the 4.9 is the one, the standard um, model by itself, the climate model without any of this feedback from, from human behavior at all. Um, the second point is that there's cumulative infrastructure change that can significantly reduce future climate change. The non-cumulative ones, people just driving less, don't, it's not going to do it. Um, and, um, or it's not going to do much, let's put it that way. Another conclusion is that the sensitivity of the results, okay, uh, in terms of how uncertain the results are, when you incorporate human behavior, were of the same order of magnitude as the underlying uncertainties in these, the physical aspects of the model. They're very, very similar. So um, 2.8 to 3.5. So what has been done with these climate models is to essentially totally focus on the physical aspects of them. Okay, and not focus at all on the human response and feedbacks. And our argument is um, that the behavioral responses are, um, have just as much, introduced just as much uncertainty of the same order of magnitude as the physical one, so you, one should be incorporating that as well. Um, the social components with, with greatest influence are those of the functional form to extreme events and the interaction between uh, perceived behavioral control and, and perceived social norm. Um, and in terms of uh, uh, reduction, the attribution of extreme events to climate change and infrastructure mitigation are the two ways that this model results say that we could 
most reduce climate change. So the key takeaway point there is that in order to have a, uh, the results that were at the low end of this integration of the, uh, the human behavior model and the, and the social model, in order to have that work, one thing is to have infrastructure. So a, a set of policies that allow you to build up infrastructure that cumulatively reduces um, um, greenhouse gas emissions will work, whereas ones that do not policies that don't do that, don't encourage that, it's, it's just not going to work. So just encouraging people to drive less, not going to cut it, okay? Um, at least in the model results. The, um, the other thing there is that there, there needs to be a way to attribute these extreme events um, to climate change, okay? Um, and, uh, and again, um, if, so this is from results of, uh, of Peter Howell and surveys. Who do people trust? Well, when I say people, I mean the general public. And the general public is not going to trust me. Okay. Sorry. It's, uh, uh, <laughs> scientists, <laughs> and certainly not mathematicians, um, are, are not high on the list of, uh, of, of public trust with regard to, to climate change. So who do they trust? Well, uh, one is that weather reporters. Now, we've, uh, we have uh, had tremendous advances in our capability of doing short-term weather predictions, due in part to all the investment that's going on in these glo global circulation models. Uh, and um, weather reporters now can actually attribute a particular uh, set of um, responses, in this case droughts, major rain events, and so on, to climate change. There's a formalized way of doing that. It's called attribution science. And so our argument is encouraging weather reporters to actually say that this particular set of conditions that we're experiencing now is with high probability related to climate change because of the science that we know about may have more impact than anything I or uh, the scientific folks in, in the audience may, may do. Uh, and in fact, there was on... Um, um, I think it's Al Gore's site. Um, the, the, the site, if you look at it this week, it says, thank a weather reporter or meteorologist if they say climate change, okay? Um, so that's a an, an, an further indication that this, this may, have, may have impact. Okay, so uh, some next steps real quick. Uh, so we have a paper in review in uh, Earth's Future, this journal that talks about the collection, what we did was a single behavioral model. There's lots of alternative ways of taking an account of human behavior. Um, and we used a single climate model. We make the argument that it's time to actually invest a bit in thinking about how to connect a variety of behavioral models um, based on different theories to social system models that then would tie into a climate system model with different regions or components to it. So we did this globally. We know that that's you know, a uh, sort of coarse manifestation of how the world works. Um, and then there's a whole set of different climate <laughs> models. So uh, this is an argument to make a, an investment in this. Um, another thing to deal about is the potential for um, sort of incoherence and coherence spatially in it, due to the fact that there are not necessarily the same impacts of climate in different parts of the world or to different groups of individuals who may or may not be spatially segregated. So this could be economic groups. It doesn't have to be necessarily regions. Okay? Um, and this is just an illustration of, uh, of the fact that climate could have sort of separate effects on two different regions or they could have interactive effects and that's what this means by interaction uh, between them that could lead to spatial incoherence. In other words, something in one region going up in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, then the other one going down and so on. Okay? Um, and we've just uh, started to produce models for this and I will point out if anyone's interested, it's actually really hard. Um, we thought it was going to be easy to take and regionalize this. It's, it's not due to the behavioral uh, assumptions in it. So in sum, uh, we believe that the model has shown that there is some rational hope um, associated with this. By, by rational basis, we, we mean here that rather than taking these climate models, which 
uh, generally just assume, oh, what happens if we reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 20 percent or reduce it by 50 percent? What's going to happen to global temperature? Um, rather than doing that, this is a model based upon one theory for human behavior and how that behavior will dynamically feed back and interact with, with the climate system through time. Um, so by rational, that, it's, it's a way of accounting for what we, we sort of hypothesize human behavior uh, would, behave, uh, would, would, would be rather than some fixed assumption of a reduction. Okay? Um, and um, as for hope, well, the models do indicate that there are indeed circumstances in which there is a significant reduction in, in global temperature. Um, and, uh, and certainly these global uh, climate models have had a huge impact on our capabilities, both on the weather end of things as well as on the, um, the IPC, the sort of broader uh, perspective of what's happening. Um, and, and the next steps, though, are uh, a bit problematic because social science um, is not necessarily as well characterized in model um, structure as the physical models that are, have a basis on, in experiment and physical observation. Um, and it, there, there is, we call it a fear on the part of social scientists of incorporating more potential uncertainty associated with these other aspects uh, that could then re reduce the um, capability of making, uh, in, in any sense, uh, accurate pro projections of the future. Um, but we, we think it's really important to do so, and we en encourage any physical scientist to be open to that possibility. So, uh, and I will be quiet there because I've gone a little bit over, but thank you uh, very much for your time and attention, and I'm happy to, uh, to address questions. Because she has to leave soon to. Uh, you should introduce uh, yourself. Yeah, oh, I'm Simon Levin. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so I open up the floor to uh, to questions. Give give you a chance, Elka, if you have any before you leave, any questions. But um, Lou, I wanted to to ask you about the role of institutions, organizations, and things of that sort, because it seems to me that a lot of the behaviors are not just uh, involving individuals, but individuals that interact with. Uh, with companies, with insurance companies, mm -hmm. with hedge funds, and with governments, and what's the role of them in these models? Yeah. So this model was far too simplified yeah. to have anything like that. In fact, you could think of the components as not individuals at all, but some kind of organizational yeah. structure. It doesn't, I mean, it was very not explicit about that. But I, I, uh, but I concur that um, in next steps, the, the sort of social grouping that graph that I put up there in terms of breaking down um, would be much more appropriate to incorporate um, some way of thinking about those connected individuals. That is uh, um, part of the idea of these mul this multi-modeling approach of taking account of alternative structures for uh, those organizational interactions and, and, uh, and we didn't talk at all about economics. Okay. So that's another major component that's missing, and uh, we've actually uh, requested a further group that, that deals with this with, with other now, ones. Along so. the lines of economics, are there any models of uh, analyzing corporate behavior, particularly different corporate interests, that might help us understand the impact of the Competing interests here. Yes. We really need to get the corporate world on board with this. Really, I, I, well, so I, um, is there anyone in the room who's done that model? <laughs> I, I just want to ask because <laughs> there might be. Um, so I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure that I completely concur. Okay, um, and 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 again, I'll I'll use example. I mean, there are things that happen. Um, in this country uh, that are major changes in behavior that don't necessarily have anything to do with corporate responses. I mean, the rapidity with which uh, the uh, gay marriage changes have, occ have occurred um, are, were striking. Um, and I, I certainly didn't expect it. I, I think that many other people didn't. And, 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 but I, I, I'm not, to some people it wasn't rapid at all, of course. But 
corp the corporate world got on board with that. Yes. It was addressed. Yes. So, I mean, you, you really need to get, it's not just individual, and I agree with you. I mean, there's been substantial social change opinions regarding issues like gay marriage, but we're talking about products and production and, you know, to, to address such a huge issue which has negative impact for certain corporate interests, mm -hmm. you're going to have to get them on board. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not disagreeing at all. Um, I'm not quite sure what uh, the models will be able to do to assist in that process. That's um, a highly political uh, uh, process as well as one in which um, there's obviously the profit com component to it. I, I will say that I, I have been involved in, um, in a couple of, there's a, a, a committee of the National Academy that, that deals with um, essentially uh, problems arising from uh, behavior, uh, corporate behaviors that are detrimental to the environment, okay, um, uh, environmental health re related. And, uh, and the number of uh, corporations that have s seen a benefit to looking carefully at green chemistry, uh, th there's been significant change in that over the, over the last 20, 30 years. Um, I can't claim that that's necessarily a good model, and there certainly are companies that are, <laughs> well, there's regulations pushing back against this now. Okay, yeah. but, um, but I think there's some hope there, all right? Um, can I point to a basis for hope on that? Eh, not that easily. Yeah. Steve. Uh, so, so I want to just follow up on this line a, a bit. One of the things you didn't mention was induce, inducement of technological change. Yes. And the simple fact is that over the last 15 years, we've seen a reduction in the cost of non-emitting technology. Mm -hmm. It's unlike any uh, change in energy technology over the previous 100 or 150. So much so that now it's possible to design uh, infrastructure that would not emit, for instance, in the US and cost consumers about what we pay today. Yep. Now, the infrastructural mix that we have, though, would need a firm source of electrical power, and the current firm sources of non-emitting electrical power we have are either nuclear okay. or gas with yeah. carbon capture and storage. And as a result, if we were to adopt this, all right, the amount of gas used by the US would go up for a generation. And so it's no surprise that um, the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, which is the 13 largest oil and gas producing companies in the world have bound together and devoted several billion dollars to lobbying for and also investing in all this sort of stuff. And so I think corporations are involved already by way of producing a market for the technology that was induced by societal's interest in this problem. And it's the precisely the sort of feedback that you talked about, but it's not really captured in the model of Right. No. So, uh, so, so, do you have any, it, uh, you have any um, aspirations to contribute to the theory that's been useful to you? I, I think that um, that is an extension that we have certainly not thought about. We have thought a bit about the technological fix part part of this, okay? Because that does tie into um, the capability for response of the system. Okay. In other words, if people perceive that there is a technological fix that will work and reduce the, the future risk, then that enhances behavioral control um, in, in our simple model, and that therefore enhances the likelihood that there will be a response. Um, but I, I, that's not exactly what, what you're talking about, but I can, I can see how that could, could tie in. Sure. Yeah. A question around uh, oh. how you model the risk of those Oh, sorry. Was it the, the oh, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so risk aversion, is there um, a risk, is, is there a potential for people getting desensitized to the increase in frequency of extreme events and yeah. saying the last five years have been the hottest years on record? How do you manage that? Yeah, so in the model, we have this, uh, it's a moving average uh, part so that if, 
if indeed it's been hotter, and I, the, the time period we typically use in this those variables, 10 years. Um, and so if indeed uh, the, the changes are not significantly different from the 10-year moving average, then it doesn't happen. So that's, that's sort of how we instantiated that, um, that notion in, in the, into this. Is it the right way? Well, I don't know. I, I don't know. There's, there's, there's data about forgetting, and, and so we based it a bit on that. So is being able to attribute an extreme event to climate change was central both to the individual model and then also your policy solution of mm -hmm. weather casters? Mm -hmm. um, my understanding is that usually scientists are incredibly reluctant or unable to link a discrete event to climate change. Um, and so if that, so how, how do you see that going forward? And a, especially how do you make that policy sort of robust to the fact that every time it snows, Trump says, thanks climate change? Yeah. So. Um, uh, I, I mean, it's a very good question. There is, um, uh, has been developed over the last decade or so uh, what is called the body of work on attribution science. And it's a well-documented now body of science. If you want a, uh, a, a good summary is there's a National Academy report that came out about two years ago. If you just go to nap.edu and uh, attribution science, it'll come right up. Um, and there's been significant enhancements of our capabilities, our meaning the physical science capabilities. I'm not talking, this is not human behavior modeling at all, um, to uh, actually attribute a particular set of climate events to global, uh, global change in, in temperature. Not to greenhouse gas emissions. That's a separate issue, okay? Um, because these are, they're running these climate models based on history. Um, and, uh, and so we're, we're much further along, but you are perfectly correct that um, whenever there's a large snowfall, <laughs> you know, some people are going to say, ah, this is proof that there's no such thing as climate change. But all you got to do is sort of look at the mean trends and hopefully someone might be convinced if they were rational about it. So good question. Thanks. Yeah. So the, the previous kinds of models, they, they had a, a forcing that would correspond to basically different policies. And in your model, you try to create this autonomous system that makes these predictions. Right? Is there room for an intermediate case where you still can understand the role of different policies, but have part of the system being roughly autonomous? Yeah. So I, I, I think uh, the point here is that how do you, how do you build interactions between policy change and interventions in that way, some set of mitigation strategies into this. And yes, you could certainly do that. We did not, okay, because we took the standard future representative pathway um, and yes, uh, but all of the, I mean, all of the standard representative pathways that basically have some kind of assumption about what's going on. So you'd, you could choose any of those. We chose one of them. Okay, you could choose any of those with different policy assumptions underlying them and then put it into this model. That's, that's perfectly correct. Yeah. Steve? Oh, I just was going to give a commercial for a local NGO. The, the, um, the, the, the ability to uh, attribute extreme events and the scientific consensus right, to be able to do so was engineered on purpose. So, so um, uh, about five years ago, this group here called Climate Central, which is a climate communication organization, and we discovered that this science was inevitably going to, co to coalesce around the idea that it was possible to statistically attribute it, mm -hmm. and that the various groups that were doing it disagreed with one another in exactly the same way that they disagreed with one another when they were doing climatological attribution in the 1990s. Hmm. And it was only intercomparison studies where they all attributed the same thing that they discovered that the differences in their methods weren't material. They concluded the same thing. So we raised the money mm -hmm. to um, do 10 years worth of intercomparison studies in 18 months. Then two of us joined the National Atmospheric Board to propose the National Academy Review you mentioned. Right. They accepted it the same day, and we had the funding lined up. So it was the most <laughs> rapid production of such a finding ever in the Academy's history. And Climate Central then organized, and they currently have 600 weather forecasters that produce this information. Mm -hmm. The next iteration is, is forecast attribution. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow's going to be another global warming day. Right. All right? And so, so the, the sort of hotbed of that has been on one NASA 
Paul, uh, one, one Palmer Square, if anybody uh, wants to get involved. Oh, interesting. Great. That's wonderful, Steve. Thanks. We were going back to some of the previous points we made. Uh, you may have seen the announcement last week that the Norwegian Oil Fund, or the Norwegian Pension Fund, which is a trillion dollar plus fund, was it decided to shift a lot of its investments from carbon heavy stuff to um, less polluting things. And that's a decision made on economic ground. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there are a number of hedge funds and, uh, uh, and insurance companies like Prudential that are starting to worry about that. Mm -hmm. One word that didn't come up in your lecture, but it's in the background, is, the dis is discount. What's the discount rate? How much do people care sure. about today relative to the future? Yep. I think companies um, are, are corporations and investment companies are becoming more likely to take action on things than than governments because governments have a higher discount rate. They get yeah. Rate. No, I I think that's a great point. Right. The discount so I think rate that the, the, the next step in incorporating companies and corporations as well as governments and the linkage between both their economics and also how individual decisions, how, what people care about and, and, and what, what companies, companies care, care about, about, is going to be really important yeah. in this. Well, if there are no All other right. questions, please uh, join me in, oh, there's one right here, sorry. Okay, yeah, when I leave this room, I'll go back to my neighboring community, which is a highly diverse community, mm -hmm. and there are two groups that I Oops. would like to interact with. One is a lower income part of our neighborhood, mm -hmm. which people generally spend not to have an interest at all in global warming. It's not something that impacts their day-to-day -day living. But the one, to me, which is more frustrating, since I come out of the petrochemical business, uh, is the folks who are highly technically trained, but, but are trying to convince me that what's going on is, is uh, normal. Cycles or, yeah, yeah, cycles. You yeah, know, yeah. sunspots and cycles. Yeah. And, and, and so I'm looking for the right, the right response to that. <laughs> um, I, I'm not, so, um, I'm not sure that there is a single right response at all. I think that this is very individual, okay? Um, and that, um, that, you know, a skeptic is, may well remain a skeptic and there may be nothing you can do about it, okay? And you have to just accept that, that fact that there's some portion of the population that think about the world differently and with different utility functions, different sort of comparisons about how the world behaves and what matters to them than, than you have. Um, and, uh, you know, as a, as a scientific person, I think evidence matters, but there's a large fraction of the population for whom evidence doesn't matter at all, okay? Um, about a lot of things. Uh, uh, yeah, about a lot of things, uh, yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so I, I suggest Focusing on those individuals who um, actually, you know, might uh, might change. And um, uh, when, when I think about what what drove the, the changes, for example, in gay marriage, okay, um, it was um, it was because, in part, people saw people they cared about being affected by this. So one way to have risk you know, perception change is because people see that their friends, neighbors, uh, relatives in other parts of the world have been negatively impacted by a drought condition, by, you know, what, what essentially is major change uh, due to climate. And that means they have to understand that indeed these things are happening and it's impacting their friends, neighbors, and relatives. Um, and, and that's, you know, I, is there an easy way to have that happen? I don't, I don't think so, but I'm Particularly sorry. people in the petrochemical industry have them read Schlumberger's handbook on climate change, oh. the single best thing written about this. And it addresses the sunspot issue and a whole bunch of uh, 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 sort of foamy, uh, uh, foamy stories um, very effectively to people in the industry. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right, well, thank, thank you all very much. Yeah. Thanks.